I'm going to quickly review where we were yesterday, uh, last time, and we introduced a whole lot of terminology on this new topic. Today's class, we're going to use that terminology fairly intensively and do uh, several problems in class and show how we can start to design these mixed assembly units. So we had said that what we're dealing with in this instance is a three-phase system. We've got, I'm sorry, not three phases, three species system. Um, we've got a lot of new terminology here, and the problem is with this terminology, different books will use different words for the same thing. So let's, uh, let's just quickly recap some of that. What we're doing is we're essentially trying to separate the solute A, which is introduced into some sort of feed stream. So we've got what we call a carrier and a solute. So if you want to do an analogy here, the carrier would be water, and solute would be something that's dissolved in that water, some other species dissolved in there. So for example, acetic acid. So a carrier is, is carrying that solute acetic acid, and we'll always call the solute A. And we're going to try and move that solute out of the carrier into the solvent. So we add a solvent as well. So three species entering. And this combined stream, so there's some percentage of solute, some percentage of carrier, we'll call it feed. So feed and the solvent we described last time are, are mixed, well mixed in this unit. And then there's a, a the solvent mixture with the solute and the carrier. They're contacting each other, and the aim is to transfer the solute to the solvent. So this three species mixture will will allow it to move away from the impeller, and we get this sort of dispersion forming. So there's bubbles of solute and solvent and carrier, and they, they'll separate into two separate phases. So there'll be this phase up here, which we'll then remove, and this phase below. And typically, it's the solvent that's less dense, and it floats above the carrier phase. So the solvent phase will report to the top, and hopefully that solvent over there will be uh, heavily loaded with solutes. So this is our extract. And this stream over here is raffinate. So this should have low solute, and this should have high solute. So that was the, that terminology we introduced. And we will also use extensively mass fractions to tell how much percentage of species is in each of these streams, and we will use subscripts uh, to de designate what the species are, and the letters X and Y are dependent on the stream. So typically, raffinate streams will, will designate them X's, and extract streams will designate those mass fractions as Y. Then last time we, we went through several diagrams of and illustrations of these units, so I won't recap those again. Just the geometry, the different ways of contacting those three, three uh, species. But we left last time with this question, and based on what the, our discussion in class was, there's a lot of discussion on what the solvent is and how it should be chosen. And one of the main issues are solvent is that that's going to be affecting the economics. Right? So the solvent is taking up the solute, we're going to then remove the solute out of the solvent phase later on and recycle the solvent back again to be reused. So there's several characteristics of the solvent that we, we need, right? The main one is that the solvent must be capable of picking up the solute. So we want a solvent that's going to have high affinity or selectivity for that solute. That's the very first point over there. And Clearly, we don't want our carrier to take up that, uh, um, our carrier to move into the solute phase. So this stream leaving over here should be relatively free 
of the carrier's uses. Okay, so that is another criteria that we want from that solvent. The solvent should pick up the solute, but not pick up any of the carrier. Now, it will always pick up some of it, but we certainly want that to be low. Then once we take this extract stream, we're going to want to separate that solute out of the, the solvent. So that ability to do that separation which follows this should be done easily. And typically we will use a little bit of heat, so a distillation system, um, so that volatility difference between the solute and the, and, this, um, and the solvent chosen should be very, should be reasonable, right? So you can actually create a separation later on. Uh, other things that we would like is, these, these are sort of sub-criteria, sub is that we want that solvent to be stable, so we can recycle it many times through the system, and we don't want it to be a uh, foam or, or de degrade in some way. Obviously, if it's non-toxic, non-flammable, that's really great, and many solvents actually do not have that characteristic. So think of the organic solvents you've used in laboratories, they're, they're toxic, they're flammable, so we, it's, it's hard to find a good solvent that's also non-toxic and non-flammable. Um, we want it to be cheap, obviously, and there's a, a list there. So it's, it's pretty tough to find a solvent that meets all those criteria. There's a lot of computer-based software to do the solvent selection, right? So um, when I, I teach a graduate course here at the University of 765, this is one of the topics we look at is how to select solvents using data analysis and statistics so that we can get these criteria. But it's, it's not trivial to select these, these solvents. Okay, let's go back. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over the slide. It's not really too necessary to understand here. Um, I'd like to talk next about how we actually go and figure out how much the solute moves from the stream and reports to the extract and how much solute remains from the rest. So by the end of today's class, you should be able to say for a given system at equilibrium, how much solute is in an extract and how much is in the rest. So let's take a look at how we do that. Well, we have to go do a variety of experiments to understand the thermodynamics and the equilibrium of our system. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll perform these experiments in the lab. So last time I'd asked, how many of you have done these sort of experiments? So where you shake up the system and you've got your two phases, you separate it out, right? So how do you, what do you do right at the beginning? What do you add to that flask? phase that's at the top there typically. You add a bit of solute and you add your carrier stream. So you add the three species in a known ratio. So that's the key point. Add the three species in a known ratio, shake it up, and then you decant your two phases and measure the concentrations or the mass fractions in each phase. Okay, so what we'll then do from that set of experiments is you'll be able to establish that sort of triangular diagram. So you, how many of you have seen these before? Like these are, this is chemistry, right? So I know you have seen it before. If you haven't stuck in your hand, you're lying. So we have seen these before, and we need to know how to use them. And so let's quickly recap what's going on here. This diagram is showing, and add this to your notes, this is important, the mass fractions. It's not mole fractions or anything else, it's mass fractions typically done. So at this corner over here, a point on that diagram at this corner indicates you've got 100% water, no MIBK, and no acetone. Okay, so water in this case is my, is my carrier. So if we want to put our notation on there, what we're plotting essentially is the way my carrier, here MIBK is my solvent, and acetone is my solute A. So if I take a mixture then of 10% water, I'm going to be, a 10% water mixture is going to be anywhere along this line. 
So this is my 10% line for water, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, up to 100. So as I, as I move, oh actually wait, this is in fives. Okay, I think this is in 5% steps. So yeah, so this will be a 5% water mixture, a 10% water mixture will be along this line. There's the 10 over there, 20% water mixture, 80, 90%, 100% water mixture. Mixtures with a zero acetone will be anywhere along this bottom edge. Okay, so as I add more acetone to my, to my system, the mass fraction, I read up horizontally along those lines. Okay, and then MIBK is the remainder. So let's just quickly recap how to use these diagrams, and I'll let uh, someone else do that from the University of Colorado. Um, there's a great series of videos actually on YouTube for reactor design, separation processes, thermodynamics. A lot of our core ChemEng courses are, are, uh, are on a sequence of videos, um, which if you're looking at the YouTube channel, it's Learn ChemEng. Okay, so if you, this is exactly where this is from. So let's take a look at how this guy is. <coughs> This screencast is going to go over a phase diagram for a ternary system. So we can take something that's partially miscible with three species, water, acetone, and MIBK, and we can represent them here by this, by this triangular phase diagram. All right, now it's important to notice that this particular phase diagram is for a system where the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Now two things can happen when we mix these three species together in a liquid form. One, they can remain as a single phase, or two, they can separate into two phases. And this all depends on the amounts of each species in the solution. For example, if we were to make a solution that we'll call solution A, and we'll say that it is 70% acetone, 10% water, and 20% MIBK, we could plot exactly where the solution is in the phase diagram. I'm going to use a highlighter to do this. You can see that as we increase up towards acetone, the top of that triangle would represent 100% acetone solution. So 70% would be somewhere along this line. If we do the same thing for water, a 10% solution of water would be somewhere along this line. And then a 20% solution in MIBK just so happens to fall where these two already intersect. So we represent the point solution A right there. And as you can see, this is outside of this envelope region. We'll call this region one. Well, when any solution falls in region one, it stays as a single phase liquid. So the other thing that could happen is if we fall under that envelope. So let's make up a solution that might do that. Let's say solution B is 33% by mass, again, all of this is by mass, 33% acetone, 33% MIBK, and 33% water. Otherwise, an equal mass ratio of all three species. Now, when we look at the lines here, 33% is going to fall somewhere below that 30 line. MIBK is going to be somewhere along their 30 line, and water somewhere in front of its 30 line. This ball is exactly dead center of the triangle for this phase diagram, so we'll draw it right around there. Now the trick here is, as I mentioned, it separates into two phases. These lines that you see are known as tie lines. They connect compositions of the two liquid phases in equilibrium. You basically go to each side following those tie lines as guides. So if we do that, we're going to come along here to this side and up here to this side. And just as a disclaimer, Reading any kinds of diagrams or plots can be a little open to interpretation. So hopefully you, our answers are somewhat similar to each other's. This is going to be known as the water-rich phase because it's heavy in water. And this is going to be known as the MIBK-rich phase because it's obviously heavy in MIBK. So now we read these two separate plots. For the MIB, it looks like about 53% MIBK. And then if we read the acetone, we're going up in the plot, so we have 10, 20, 
30, just under 40. So we'll say, I don't know, maybe around 38 weight percent. At this point, you could just add them up to one. Now, if we go towards water, I think weight percent looks pretty good. So that's the MIB case rich phase. The water rich phase, we just go to the other side. And we're going to look, and it's about, I'm going to say 67% water. And then we go up towards acetone, so it's about a little higher than 25, somewhere between 25 and 30, so we'll say 28 weight percent acetone. That leaves us with 5 weight percent MRVK, which is right around that line, so that looks pretty good. So we started with the equal mass of each species, and when they face separate reach equilibrium at 25 degrees Celsius, we had two phases with the following compositions. So notice that 
if you one way to remember it is that it's P and K, and then you have to have the other letter, which is Q on the other side. Or K and Q, and then the other letter is P. So easy to measure the length PK, easy, easy to measure KQ, we can get uh, that equal to the mass of Q divided by the mass of P. Sorry, we're not talking about energy. Okay, so you can see it either as mixing P and Q and then forming that ratio, or the other applies. If you take a mixture K, it will settle out into P and Q, and you can um, do that same calculation. Now, the interesting thing is that the Lieber rule applies anywhere in the triangle. Okay, so, for example, there's nothing that says it has to start and end on this curve over here. I can have a point over here and a point over there. I can apply the Lieber rule on that along that straight line. So x, y, and z. So the points don't need to touch anything. They don't need to be on this arc shape. They don't need to be starting at a corner. There's no, not, no criteria like that. Any straight line within the triangle um, is where the Lieber rule applies. And in fact, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it even applies outside the triangle. And we'll see that coming up next class. Okay. Yes, Mark. What does that represent of the, of the curve? Because underneath the curve, that's the phase. Okay, so in the video, anything that's inside this region one is what the instructor there call it, is where the, the two phases do not separate. Oh, well, what, there's no point in oh, okay. I'm just illustrating that it applies anywhere, no matter oh, okay. the There's no criteria that you have to be within the end okay. Right, so if you have two, you split into two streams, or you have two different solutions? Well, let's say if you took a mix, um, here, for example, if I took a mixture X, and I blended it with the mixture Z, the mixture of those two will end up at Y. So um, yeah, the line can go from inside the circle to outside yeah. the circle. Right. I could also take something along here, right? So J, K, and L. <coughs> so and the lever rule can apply anywhere in that diagram. Okay. So. I'll skip over question one. We'll, we'll talk about that at another time. Let's take a look over here. Give this one a shot. You're mixing the feed stream F. So the stream coming in here is feed. We'll call this F, typically. So F is coming in with that <coughs> position. Okay, what do we notice about that stream F? What about its composition? There's no S. Okay, so there's no solvent in this feed stream. It only contains the carrier and the solute A. So I'm mixing that, and we'll call that point over there, we'll call XF. So X subscript F is the composition of that point. And I'm going to mix it with a pure solvent S. Where is the mixture going to be? So how, it depends on how much you're going to mix. Right, so how much F am I mixing with S is definitely going to make that, or help determine where that mixture is going to lie. Okay, but can draw the line that connects F and S, right, and the mixture will lie will line up anywhere along that the diagonal line. So. Mixture M will be anywhere along that line. And here I've, I've placed it over there, and we can go determine where M is based on the legal rule. So I'll, I'll go through an example of that in a minute. Okay, but the, the important point is anytime you're mixing any two streams, you know automatically that the mixture will be somewhere on a straight line connecting the two of them. Let's take a look at, uh, at the next one. So 
let's assume that that mixture is there at M. What will be the composition of the raffinate and what will be the composition of the extract? On the, on the corners. Well, A is our solvent. We typically will always put that at the top of the triangle. C and S, the carrier and the solvent, are little interchangeable. So it depends on your source. We'll, we'll flip them around. OK, so don't learn that one is always on the left, or well, extract is on the left and raft is on the right. That's not going to be true. Okay. So where where is this mixture going to come to equilibrium? Or let me ask it this way. Is the extract going to have a higher concentration of, of A, or is it the raffinate that's going to have a higher concentration of A? Okay, so which side is extract? Right, left. Okay, so extract is over here, and this mixture will come to equilibrium. We interpolate between those tie lines. So you can add that then onto your diagram. Extract will come onto over here, and it's going to have a higher concentration of A than the raffinate. So raffinate has a lower concentration. Now these tie lines are, are almost certainly never parallel. So when you do your interpolation, you have to account for that as well. So if the, if the tie lines kind of angle out, your, your interpolation needs to accommodate for that. You'll see some of that coming up next. <coughs> okay, I'm going to jump to uh, question five instead. And this is one uh, that could be a little bit more uh, challenging for you. Work through this one at the moment. I'll hand out um, this uh, same diagram here on a larger printout for you so you can work through it. But the, our intention here is what we're doing is we're, we're taking a basis settler and we're feeding it at a continual basis. So 20, uh, 250 kilograms per hour of feed. Okay, so always when we do these calculations, we have some basis of time usually. So 250 kilograms per hour of feed coming in with this composition, 24% A, 76% carrier, no solvent. My solvent, on the other hand, is coming in at a lower flow rate, 100 kilograms per hour, and it's pure solvent. So XS, comma S, so here refers to the solvent's composition is one. What I'd like you to do is find the mixture mass, that's an easy one for you to get. What's the mass of mixture? But then what's the composition of the mixture? composition of A, C, and the solvent S in that mixture. So um, when I come around, say, uh, hand these diagrams up, please take two, one for now and one for practice later on at home. Um, there should be enough to go around, two for everyone.
somewhat slightly easier to actually do a mass balance. Well, we've got M is F plus S. The mixture is F plus S. But we can also then do a component or species balance. So you can pick any one of the species, A, C, or S, to do your balance on. Well, let's take uh, the solute. So if F plus S is equal to M, we also have that X in the feed stream of the solute. So X, F, A. How much of A is in the feed multiplied by the feed mass? So remember, these are mass fractions multiplied by the mass plus X, S, A multiplied by the mass of solute is equal to X, M, A multiplied by the mixture. So there's a, a mass balance on that. Now we know that X S A is zero. There's no A in the solvent stream. And this is zero. X F A is given to us. It's 0.24, and we're feeding that at 250 kilograms per hour. So that's equal to X M A multiplied by the mixture's mass, which is 350. So solving for XMA gets you a value of 0.17, 17%. Okay, so now that you actually know what the mass fraction of A is in, in the mixture, we Actually, we don't know yet that M is at this point, right? We've simply just connected the solid red line between F and S, but we don't know where M is. I can just move this point along so that I get it to be at about 17% from the bottom to the top. Okay, so that can, that can start to locate my, my point M over there as a rough guide. Now, I could have also done a species balance on the solvent. So in the same way as I did here for the solutes, I can do a balance for the solvents. So the, the nice thing about the solvent is that the solvent is 100% S here, and there's no solvent coming in my feed. So it's quick to actually find that XM, the percentage solvent in the mixture, is 0 0.29. So that means that 29% working my way from left to right diagonally here, 29% is will also locate where point A is. Okay, and then either by difference or by doing a carrier balance, you can find that X, um, X M, C is equal to 0.54. So those add up to 1. Those three mass fractions. Did anyone use the lever rule to try and find point M? Okay, so we could also use that. Um, that's it's it's fairly straightforward to do that. What you say is mass of S, the mass of solvent. That's something that you know. Divided by the mass of the feed. That's also something that we know. Okay. What length is mass S equal to? So we want, it's the ratio of two lengths. Mass S is equal to, what else is on the numerator on the? Fn. Fn. Okay, mass of F. Yes. Okay, so, but here's, here's the issue. Right? Take a look at this. If I, if I'm doing, I, so let's put, Assume we haven't done these calculations over here. I mean, I could have done those, but let's say I haven't. My aim is to find where M is. Right? But if my distance here, both these distances require that I know where M is. So MF means I know where M is, and MS means I know where M is. So those are not useful um, distances. So let me, let me pick another, another lever to try. And what you can do is say, well, let me take the mass of F divided by the mass of M. What's mass of 
F equal to is ms. We had that one before. But what is the mass of m equal to this time? <laughs> SF, okay? So that denominator distance, mass of m equal to SF, that denominator distance is easy to measure. I know where S is, I know where F is, I can go measure that length of Y. And on my particular printout, that happened to be um, 113 millimeters. Okay. And then I can go find <coughs> length MS. And that's equal to the mass of F divided by the mass of M, which is 250 kilos divided by 350. So I can quickly then find that that length MS on my scale was 81 millimeters. Okay, so I measure MS or SM was 81 millimeters. That's the, the difference. And then the total length was 130 millimeters. Uh, I'm curious, why couldn't you do the mass of S and the mass of F? And so that would give you a ratio of like where M sits in between the two. If you do that, it's like, like 40% that's like the difference between them, or like one like, and it's 60% between like S and 40% Right, yeah, it's just a, it's just a little okay. bit more trial and error. Oh, okay. Right, so this is like, you can definitely do it this way. Okay. It's just this way you can just measure once and you can be done. So you get 40% if you do that. Like if you do that, you do that. You do, uh, sorry, S yeah. over F. <laughs> So that 40% represents. It's a 40 60 ratio over there. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, and that's why it's called the lever rule. Yeah. Okay, so now locate on this diagram where E and R are. What is the extract and the raffinate leaving from the system? is find the composition of the two phases leaving in equilibrium. So find X, R, A, C, and S, and Y, E, A, C, and S. Yes. Okay. Going to that. So where's the extract? Where's the raffinate? I uh, can help you out with it. Extract? Anyone? That's where. Okay. Extract somewhere. Is it down here? This point? Okay. So interpolate in these dashed lines. These dashed lines are your ties, tie lines. Notice how they arc a bit. So this point to interpolate is over there, and that extract is up here. Let me show the solution then to you. It would be something along that blue line. Okay, so the extract is the solvent rich phase, and raffinate is the other one. Okay, so the easy part actually is to find the compositions of them, because you simply read off where that intersects. So E1, for example, is got the composition, if we're looking for the carrier percentage in E1, E1C 
is 6%, so it's 6% along that distance. E1A is 0, 10, 20, 30 something, so 33%. And E1S then is the remainder, 61%. Or you can check as 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, something like percent. Okay, so these numbers will never quite, everyone will have slight, slight differences in their answers. So the easy step is to get the compositions. How did I find R1 mass and E1 mass? about that. Um, uh, I know based on when we reviewed it well, two weeks ago and I asked you to write down what your thoughts were about the hard questions and so forth. Surprisingly, actually everyone did fairly well on those questions despite your anxiety of feeling that you hadn't. Um, but there was two, one aspect that I was fairly uh, disappointed on and that's the lack of like just following a systematic strategy. So you've noticed in every example I've done in class we've always uh, followed by and large the plan, planning our approach, what is our aim, what do we know, what we don't know, and exploring. And so it was pretty kind of, kind of disconcerting to see that only five out of the 60 midterms actually used that strategy on those questions. So it was, um, please follow that strategy, it's not there just for, for fun, right? Like, like, you know, like, okay, no, I'm talking about the people that got it wrong. Alright, so um, like work through it. If you know it intuitively, it's okay. But also, if you, even if you do know it, there's still people that end up with a whole jumble of equations and not really a strategy. Okay. So the other thing I just wanted to point out about the midterm is just a second. Um, so as you all know, with my courses, it's I'm not about the grades. It's all about the concepts and understanding and the critical thinking. Right. So one of the I. What I plan to do is to make the midterm, I will grade it such that if your final exam grade weighted as if it concluded the midterm portion is greater than the two separately, I'll take the higher of the two. So it's essentially a, a no risk, it was essentially then a no risk midterm. If the midterm grade is low and your final exam grade is high, there will be no penalty from that aspect. Okay? So I have to 